We will start on time and we will finish on time. And uh, it, this is after the siesta, so I hope you're all uh, well awake because we have a great session for you. We have a fantastic panel, which I will go through in a second. And uh, we hope we'll have a very interactive and uh, interesting uh, session. And if we do, it's because you, the audience, gets involved. So uh, please don't hesitate at any point in time to uh, stand up, say what you have to say, or ask a question. So uh, <clears throat> we have essentially four industries here, the health, consumer, technology industry, and the, and the travel industry. And we have five CEOs of large companies for you today on this panel. Uh, we have on my left here Patricia Wirtz, who is, uh, of course, the CEO of uh, Archer Daniel, uh, Daniels Midland, ADM. She's a co-chair of the annual meeting, and she's a co-chair of the annual meeting, that's right, and a co-chair of the consumer industry's governor's meeting. Uh, next to Pat, we have Paul Bolke, who is the uh, CEO of Nestle, also a co-chair of the uh, uh, governor's meeting for consumer industries. Next to this is Frederick uh, Baxas, who is the CEO of Telenor Norway, which is obviously a major uh, telecom uh, uh, company. Next to Frederick is uh, James Hogan, who represents the aviation industry as CEO of Etihad Airways and uh, was uh, uh, chair of the Governor's Meeting for Aviation, Travel and Tourism. And then last but not least, we have Lars Sorensen, who is CEO of Novo Nordisk uh, and uh, was chair of the uh, governor's meeting for healthcare. So I think you'll agree with me that is a pretty impressive panel that cuts across a number of industries, many of them focused on the consumer, which is, which is great because in this economic environment, uh, the consumer is making a big difference in terms of uh, leading or not leading the recovery. And um, they, will, they will briefly give you a, a sort of an update on how uh, the major output they got out of the governor's meeting and uh, uh, in three or four or five minutes, each of them. And then we'll open up for questions from the audience and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. So uh, <clears throat> without any further ado, I would, uh, I think the, all, all us gentlemen here have agreed that Pat should go first. <laughs> I mean, that's the least we can do. And uh, so Pat's going to go first, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So Pat, it's all yours. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, as uh, co-chair of the governor's session uh, this Davos, along with Paul Bolke to my left here, uh, we're going to share a little bit of the output of that agenda. And it might be helpful to know that what we call the consumer community really starts at the beginning of the chain, including companies in agriculture, um, both seed production, producers, uh, processors, transportation, all the way through those who then take um, uh, the original products and and produce them, whether they be food companies or others, and then all the way to retail. So it's quite a wide chain uh, described in the consumer community. Uh, as part of that community, I think we had a very bold-looking, forward-looking agenda and had a great discussion this time. Uh, four topics which remain at the forefront of our agenda are some topics which have been worked for multiple years, so they have great traction and results. Uh, one topic which has only been worked for seven months, but again has quite a bit of traction and we plan to go forward with that. Those four topics are sustainable consumption, water, health and wellness, particularly wellness of our, our employees, and a new vision for agriculture. So I thought I'd talk very briefly about two of them, the wellness and the new vision for ag, and Paul will uh, follow up on the ones on sustainable consumption and water. Uh, we also had a great session after our governor's meeting 
on uh, leadership and leadership values. We had authors, uh, Thomas Friedman, as well as Doug Seidman, and uh, an excellent session. And again, we're going to share a little bit of the outcome of that. Uh, first, on the new vision for agriculture, this is the one that has only been worked for about seven months, and it really has an engagement of public and private sector. Uh, we had several meetings during the week on the subject, uh, kind of broken out into three parts, food security, economic development, and environmental sustainability, all very important aspects of agriculture. Um, it certainly looked at it from many perspectives, but one of them that was uh, quite helpful to, to keep in mind, because of course we need to feed a growing population, was that investment in agriculture has twice as much, some even quote as much as four times as effective, of reducing poverty levels in countries than investment in any other sector. So the importance of agriculture to both this global recovery, this economic recovery, as well as the opportunity for the long-term contribution of agriculture to feeding the world and so forth was part of um, that discussion. Uh, governments of Tanzania, India, US, they were all part of both plenary sessions as well as uh, some of our, uh, our private breakout sessions. And I think we left with uh, quite a bit of optimism and some big goals uh, and a shared commitment to make these opportunities uh, work. Uh, when it comes to the wellness in the workplace, we um, also, I could report, strong agreement to pathways to uh, a healthier and safer uh, work environment. But I know we have Lars on the panel today in the health sector, so um, I won't say more about that. So that's my uh, that's report. Thank Thanks. you very much, Pat. And because I like to be disruptive, rather than taking the rest of the consumer industries immediately, I'm going to jump to uh, Frederick. And we'll come back to the consumer industries with Paul in a moment. But Frederick, uh, I know the uh, information technology and telecom also had some uh, uh, very, uh, very interesting discussions. So uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, thank you for that. And luckily, we have some consumers in our industries as well. <laughs> um, we all do, don't we? <laughs> but um, first of all, I think uh, there is an expression here, uh, which I, um, I think we, um, or impression that we have uh, all uh, collectively experienced here, that there is a difference on Davos 2010 as opposed to Davos 2009. Last year, uh, the liquidity concern was sort of the main concern and the effects of, on that. Le this year, at least in our uh, industry sector, we have uh, addressed uh, the, the potential for growth and the need for growth uh, uh, going forward here. Um, the way I see it from my company's perspective, Telenor, being a, an operator in the Nordics, Central and Eastern Europe and Asia, there are sort of different uh, flavors of what uh, this growth from a new platform, from a new uh, baseline can, uh, can be. And of course, we're seeing the most promising signs of that growth to appear in Asia. So in a way, uh, from a low level, uh, or from a lower level than 2008, uh, I think we see uh, Asia recovering. And I, I, I feel that that is not only the case uh, for, for telecommunication, but it's sort of a general feeling. Uh, more specifically, there are 4.5 billion users, roughly, uh, of mobile telephony in the world. And it's all happened in basically 15 years. Um, and that in itself is an, uh, a tremendous contribution to economic growth uh, up through uh, the economies uh, in which it has happened. There are new services and there are new markets and there are new efficiencies gained in this uh, during this, um, uh, this journey. And remember this uh, uh, mobile phone came uh, uh, out as a luxury item and it turned into an item for the masses. Um, now it's time to ask what can sort of this type of connectivity be used for uh, in the next phase. And we believe there are uh, quite significant potentials in different areas. Um, um, and let me give you a few. During this session here, um, F2010, um, some sort of identified and, and agreed upon uh, drivers for growth is... Um, uh, not necessarily one because it ranked, uh, ranks before others, but at least one is how ICT uh, can be a definite partner in, uh, and contribute to the uh, reduction of um, uh, the carbon footprint. 
we are contributing directly ourselves and we're doing a lot in that area uh, as industries. But more importantly, there are crossovers to other industries where ICT is definitely a part of the solution. And here, a better forms of collaboration is, of course, part of the key. Then, uh, mobile density, another growth factor, might, uh, growth factor might, uh, be, but is, of course, the fact that with four and a half billion people connected, there are still some being unconnected. And the rest will also be connected in a certain period of time. So that's a growth factor in itself. But there is a more important growth driver coming be behind that, and that is that of internet access. Internet access, uh, we believe, uh, in these industry sectors, will have a profound ability to spur economic growth in general in the societies from here onwards. And still the percentage of daily internet access uh, between the huge majority of the population of the planet is fairly low. Um, the most important and probably most challenging growth driver, though, is how modern networks and uh, connectivity to that many people, how that will spur service innovation. And there, have been, there has been sessions here in, uh, in Davos uh, addressing certain of these, Indias, uh, see these potentials. This is an ecosystem between many players. And if these players sort of find win-win opportunities, then there are new solutions uh, coming forward. One of these being most significantly discussed here has been that of mobile money. How can the mobile phone in the pockets of that many people serve also the un unbanked portion of the world? And how can the, the mobile phone act as an extended arm of banking services? And what does that generate again of new activities around this? as an enabling platform. So there are many uh, items or elements of growth not necessarily having the same impact as we see as mobile itself had, but that comes on top and builds upon it. I think I'll leave it at that in the first round. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Frederick. Let's go back to consumer industries, Paul, if you, uh, if you don't mind uh, taking it on now. Yeah, back to consumers industries. First, I, I comment on these uh, government's meetings. Uh, Davos uh, is normally about uh, talking and connecting and, and uh, related to walk the talk. Uh, we may be talking a lot about the talking. Uh, what the government's meeting do is actually getting some uh, walking behind the talk in the sense that uh, what is discussed there then flows into action during the year and there is a reporting back so there's actually, uh, actually a measuring of what has been done during the year. So, but I'm going back to two topics that we discussed again, and Pat has mentioned them, sustainable, uh, sustainable consumption. And um, what we see there is that uh, um, we go the whole value chain from, from upstream to downstream. It's all integrated, uh, discussing uh, uh, this sustainability. And what we discussed there is sustainability with environment what is normally uh, first on the agenda, but also the sustainability on economical growth. How can we maintain uh, growth over time? And it has also to do, also to do with sustainability on, society, on the development of society as such. So it is really going about sustainability in a broader sense, and it has, uh, um, uh, therefore, uh, the need for multi-stakeholder um, approaches in there. So we, we, are, we talk about changing business models so that actually sustainability is an issue that is sustainable because it that makes business sense, because you integrate really the, the, the whole value chain and you drive out waste. And there is so much waste still that you can drive out of the supply chain just by integrating it better. Just uh, think about food security where you have something like 30, 40 percent of food that is lost from the field towards the end uh, consumer. That has to do with integrating supply chains. So it goes about sustainability in a much broader way. And actually, it's uh, starting to organize ourselves to respond to the needs and also the aspirations of the future generation of consumers, where sustainability is definitely going to be part of their framing. Another uh, topic that we had was, food, uh, was water security. And water security, again, was uh, something like five years ago uh, put on the agenda. It started with creating awareness of the water issue. It was all about oil and energy, and, and, and water was not so much. And, and actually, Davos has been a forum where water was put on the agenda and given the right, the right attention. And then water linked with, with uh, um, food, 
linked with energy and how all that links up together with environment. Um, out of that came actually then um, a study, a study that the charting our world of future. That was a study done by an unparalleled network of, of uh, private, public uh, sector, NGOs and also uh, academics. And what comes out of the study is that, first of all, water is local. Uh, water is a global problem, but water is a local issue and has local solutions. The water, they, they come up with a, a cost curve, call it the marginal cost-benefit curve, where you see that each country, each region has other answers to give a solution to water. And that's a very interesting insight. The transparency that you get out of it leads then to really meaningful solutions. What we got out of um, uh, this year is that we have now a, Dave, a Dav Davos initiative that is actually linking up people involving with some specific countries that say, and governments were involved, saying, let's do and let's test it out. Let's work on these curves and let's get specific answers to certain regions. So, and we have Jordan who has been uh, committing, South Africa has been committing and saying, let's do something. You have also Mexico and India. That's what I say, walking the talk. Instead of talking big things, you get uh, and you drip these, uh, these things out uh, to specific countries. So these are going to lead to specific measures. And it's amazing to see that water issues with little efforts and actually with negative cost uh, relationship means you get something out of it, uh, giving solutions to the water issues. It's really motivating. And then, and if you allow me, uh, we had a very interesting session uh, about uh, leadership values for sustainable growth. And that was a very interesting session in the sense that actually it was not really a specific topic, it was a topic about behavior. And uh, the crisis that we had, you can call it a financial crisis, at the end of the day it was a value crisis. It was a crisis that was linked with too short-term thinking and we should be long-term thinking. It was linked with uh, me only attitude or me only society, we have to think about us always society and all these things. And we had indeed, and Pat mentioned that Friedman, Thomas Friedman and um, Dov Seidman, who have already done several times interactions, who spoke about these things. It was really interesting to see that um, they were talking about what has to be done, we can discuss, that's clear. And actually what has to be done, also in companies, what you have to do is basically no competitive advantage. The competitive advantage in the future starts to be how you go about it how you go about uh, business, how you, how you do the what you have to do, and that is value-based, and that is very, very important. And actually what it does is it brings back what, the, what companies or what the private sector should be there for in society. It is creating value, and it should be creating value in everything it does. Very high value for the shareholder, definitely, because that is fueling the, the continuity of activity. It is to be successful as a company, and yet at the same time, you do it in a way in such a way, long-term inspired, that you, by the same token, you do it positively linking up with society at large, which is quite a good thing. It's actually, you hear, you hear about the new, uh, the new normal, which is totally wrong, and the new normal. Actually, we should go back to normal, because what we had before was not normal. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let's move, let's fly to the uh, aviation and travel and tourism and uh, have James tell us what, uh, what a little bit about uh, that side of the uh, of the in industry picture. Thank you. Well, travel and tourism included obviously aviation, hotels, shipping, and car rental. And we're a services sector. It's perishables. Major investment in aircraft, in hotels, in ships. So these are strategic decisions where filling the asset. Moving fast is fundamental to our industry. If I reflect on the last five years, I run a global airline. Whether it's war, SARS, tsunami, you have to be in shape to manage the risk fast. But as an industry, nevertheless, look at the opportunity. And what came out of the forum was talking about the opportunity as we go into 2010. For our sector, with the global financial crisis. That was a hit in regard to the, the corporate spend. Most of your corporations introduced policies, and from a discretionary level, it was also a hit. In addition to that, there was the pandemic, where we saw some regions in the world where people just didn't travel. Um, they were concerned, they stayed at home, so we had a double impact. And the, the challenge with aviation in our business is that catalytic effect. If people don't travel, the rest of the industry 
gets impacted hard. And we're a big employer. We're a big employer in developing countries. We're a big employer of youth. So within the economy of a range of sectors, geographies, it, it has an impact. So coming into 2010 as an industry where quietly bullish. We look at the key indicator, which is the IATA statistics. And if you look at the IATA statistics for 2009, all regions in the world, with the exception of the Middle East, were in decline. And IATA just came out with a forecast looking forward into the first two quarters of 2010, where certainly we see economy travel back at levels we're expecting to see the challenges bringing premium back. But if you look at the logistics, the cargo sector, the first area in our industry that goes in decline is cargo, heavy discounting. But the first to come out, in fact, is cargo and freight. What we've seen in the last quarter of 2009, India, the Middle East, strong growth. So as we look into 2010 as an industry, what we were talking about yesterday is how we continue to communicate. Like this isn't, you know, we are used to, to tough cycles, rebounds, but you have to go forward. You have to look at the opportunities. You have to look at ways from uh, investment, how you uh, certainly utilise your assets more effectively, but you have to also talk up the various segments that we tackle across the board. As a group, we focused on four key areas, Copenhagen, Obviously, from a, not only from an air transportation perspective, but from shipping, hotels, from car rental. The um, CEO of Hertz has 600,000 cars in the US at any one time. And he talked about a green program they have of 40,000 cars. We are, are very aggressive as the airline industry in looking at a solution at, at COP15, but it's very disjointed. Across the board, we don't look at how we link with, uh, with other industries. Security is a, a major issue for our sector. The Christmas Day incident was um, very concerning for not only aviation, for the industry overall, because if that had been successful, again, it would have put travel into decline. But the challenge with infrastructure moving forward in security is not Europe, not the US, not the developed economies, it's the developing countries, Africa, Indian subcontinent for the investment in suitable scanning, the training of people to undertake these duties. And one incident for our industry is catastrophic. So again, a key focus coming out of, of our work group is how do we work not only with our art, but across many sectors to, to tackle this issue of security in transportation and tourism worldwide. Competitiveness is, is fundamental, and we, we talked about regulation and the bilateral process. And airlines are, are bound by a very um, archaic, the Chicago Convention, bilateral process, which, not like other global industries here who can truly work globally, we're bound by negotiating with governments. In some countries, we negotiate seats, we negotiate sectors, and it gives us the, it doesn't give us the same abilities in other sectors to achieve scale. And we have a considerable uh, amount of effort invested in just working with governments to, to lobby, to change regulation, to open up the the open skies, in, in fact, that gives the whole industry the benefit of scale and opportunity. Because that led into our, our final point, which was, was employment. We're an industry that is, that is regulated, we're taxed, um, already with, in the UK, for example, a, an airport duty charge that doesn't go back into the um, industry at all. It goes into the government coffers. But what was important to us as an industry, how do we continue to focus on developing opportunities for young people? The services sector continues to grow. It is a sector where we can take not only develop, but developing countries, and the sector creates opportunity. As a group, we do develop reports coming out of Davos last year, a, a global competitive report, but the, the feeling overall was relatively bullish as we look ahead.
Thank you. Thank you very much, James. <laughs> very fascinating, the industry that uh, we all depend on <laughs> in our daily life. Uh, same with Lars. I mean, health, uh, health is, uh, is everybody's concern. And, and uh, Lars, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased to be back. I have to admit that I wasn't here during the last uh, five, six years. And in particular, I skipped last year. And since the mood apparently was very depressed, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I skipped that because <laughs> the mood was somewhat better, I'm told, uh, at, at this meeting. And uh, certainly, I feel uh, very much uh, more at home uh, re relating to the agenda, which was on this meeting because uh, one of the, the main risk studies had identified that uh, uh, non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases, is one of the major risks that the, the globe is facing. And as you know, I represent a company that is deeply involved in the long-term solutions to, uh, to chronic disease. So rethink, uh, redesign, and rebuild certainly applies to, to our industry, to the health systems, but also in particular to the pharmaceutical industry. And what I heard was a very, very strong wish to, to make uh, the approach to health much more a multi-stakeholder approach um, with much, much broader uh, involvement than just as what we usually did, uh, gather a bunch of health experts, but now rather gathering experts uh, from the civil society, people that are involved in, in urban planning, people that represent uh, large amounts of employees, faith-based organizations, etc. Just on one overall observation, which was sort of interesting, I thought, healthy society is somewhat linked to healthy planet. Uh, human beings are like any other biological creatures trying to conserve their individual energy. So we basically sleep or rest or hunt or reproduce. Now, as, as the hunting has been reduced since our, our good colleagues in the, in the food industry are producing all our goods. And since reproduction, at least uh, the, the level of reproduction, may not be able to sustain our body weight, uh, we face a serious problem. <laughs> so this means that we as, as species are spending exogenous energy. And that leads to an unhealthy planet. Now, the, the positive thing here is that if we reverse this trend, we might not only influence our health individually, our healthy societies, but also the planet. So I thought that was a, an interesting observation that we could, in a way, achieve a much, much broader agenda by changing the way we go about living our lives. In terms of uh, the agenda that we dealt with, uh, obviously prevention is, is the main way to, to, to look at uh, dealing with uh, non-communicable diseases. And in fact, we, we know what we have to do, the trouble is, as Paul also mentioned, is uh, how do we make people do what they have to do? So behavioral science and understanding what it takes uh, for us to change our lives. And the experience is rather bleak. Only in few instances has it, has it been possible to change behavior. So, but the positive thing is that we can change the behavior of the next generation, namely our children uh, that, are, that are very uh, open uh, to to new lifestyles. In terms of intervention into the current health status, uh, the, the governors of health uh, were looking into uh, three work streams. Uh, one was dealing with health data. We have an extraordinary amount of health data, but very little health information. Uh, lack of connectivity, lack of ability to use that extreme amount of health data uh, in dealing and guiding our intervention and monitoring our outcome. And it's, of course, very interesting to sit in panel with the IT and communications industry because they're obviously the ones that are going to help us find the solutions. And therefore, already there, you can see the need for a multi-stakeholder approach. Then we uh, were also discussing uh, in great detail uh, the identification of innovative delivery models. And interestingly enough, the areas where we saw innovative delivery models of care were actually in some of the emerging economies, where they're, of course, jumping uh, the systems failures uh, that we have in the developed part of the world, adopting much more telecommunication, telemedicine, uh, and new technologies in delivering care. The problem is 
can we scale this? Can we implement this in the systems in the developed part of the world? And then a third uh, track was wellness and uh, non-communicable disease, where uh, an alliance is being formed, a charter for an alliance is being drawn up uh, for corporations to join this alliance. We would like to have as many uh, corporations join as possible. It is intended that we draw up some, some minimum standards that the corporations should live up to, and that we should think about this not only obviously influencing the productivity of companies uh, by reducing absenteeism and increasing productivity of those of our employees that come to work, and perhaps where we have insurance-based systems also reduce our, our bills for insuring uh, healthcare costs. Uh, but, but the fact that we, by doing this, also are influencing these employees' families, and through that uh, we can reach out to the local communities and have a much, much greater impact uh, on society. I believe, and uh, this was shared, uh, that chronic disease is the biggest public health threat society has ever faced. It's preventable, it's treatable, and the treatment is affordable. Not doing anything is not affordable. It boils down to a basic premise, uh, which I think uh, Gandhi said quite well by saying that you should be the change you want to see. It starts with all of us. In corporations, it starts with leadership-driven programs to improve the health status of the corporations. It starts with parents uh, looking after themselves and their, and their children and influencing the civil society. So it was a very encouraging uh, couple of days with lots of interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Well, let's turn it over to the audience. Uh, we've had uh, rich, uh, rich reports here, which I'm sure have created some interest. And uh, if anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question, we have microphones. Uh, if you do so, please uh, state your name and, and tell us what institution you represent. Anybody? Uh, yes. We got a mic here for uh, the lady. Hello, my name is Jillian Manis, and I'm here actually on behalf of Vantage Point. Um, the president, our president, has made job creation one of its leading priorities. And uh, Mr. Hogan, you touched upon that in terms of employment. I'd like to just hear a little bit more from all of you on how the retraining and training of the workforce in your different sectors are going to fuel uh, this economy and uh, obviously the consumer's benefit to the consumer's benefit. Excellent. Thank you very much. Who wants to uh, take that? Frederick, please. Um, I can start a little bit on that because uh, it's, uh, of course, a, uh, a tremendous uh, important, uh, important question longer term in all the countries in which we are operating as a company and, and other places as well. Um, the underlying fact about technology involving in, in, in our field is that of less manpower. In, in, in share man years, or full-time employees, if you like. Uh, and uh, it's, in a, it's in a way and a fact that our industry, the telecom industry, has moved from being infrastructure and physical handling oriented into becoming a service and desktop. Uh, not, not for all, but the percentage and the relativeness has changed. Uh, and that's why uh, sort of growth and innovation is that important, uh, because if we don't manage to go the growth path, then we will shrink workforce-wise longer term. And in our group, we have 40,000 employees, and if I cannot grow my top line, I will deploy new technologies, and, I, and those will be simpler, and they will have greater efficiencies, and we will be fewer uh, in the next year or the year thereafter. So uh, when the growth drivers sort of hit this machinery, uh, then that doesn't happen because uh, people will focus in the growth direction. So uh, the spillover and the uh, ecosystem effect between others becomes that important uh, in this field. Uh, and that goes for uh, the way we've seen how uh, customer response centers, for example, has moved, has traveled basically from one part of the world to another part of the world, creating uh, job opportunities, uh, but that, those job opportunities will not remain there uh, unless the growth 
basically happens around the industry longer term. Yep. Pat, I think you want to add um, to this? Maybe I, I, I would add to, because your question's uh, broader than even just the current economic environment. And while I will talk generally about the industry, I'll give you a couple of examples um, within that we're doing. The, uh, the ability to work with partners to get, starting from basic education, sort of K through 12 education, people interested in the math and sciences for future higher level technical jobs in engineering and agricultural economics, et cetera. Um, I think the important thing that our industry is doing and we did is not stop this work during an economic downturn. In fact, I think we have upped our interaction to have students interested in this and upped our training programs for entry levels and, and trainees during this economic downturn. And we actually have even greater participation in our skilled labor. So these would be through, for example, in, um, in America, the at JAG program, the Jobs for American Graduates program. When you up your interaction with those for the skilled labor pool, um, we've had much higher quality of candidates, much uh, n greater numbers, quantity, because there's more interest in it. And I think for the longer term, it helps with the skill levels um, going forward. We haven't laid off anyone during this um, environment. In fact, we've created jobs because we had several capital programs. I shouldn't say laid off, a net layoff. We've had some movement around between um, plants. But because we kept our capital spending up during the period and finished seven new projects, which were new plants, um, uh, new plants within f factories, uh, We've created several hundred jobs in that process. So I think if you look at the long term related to this downturn, maybe you can find some silver linings of opportunities related to job creation, higher skill training, and advancement even in training of, of current employees. Mm -hmm. uh, Lars, you want to comment? Yeah, I just uh, want to make one comment uh, as it relates to health. If, if we look at health services, it is clear with aging populations and unfortunately with chronic disease that we are going to see increasing uh, employment in the health services, whereas, uh, as, as it relates to the pharmaceutical industry, which I represent, the picture is more like the one Frederick described, that uh, we see employment in, in, in Europe, uh, United States, and Japan being at the uh, current levels, and, and the growth of employment is in emerging markets, and where we are looking for talent, where we, with IT industries and services, can outsource uh, a lot of the, the things that we are currently doing, so growth will be there, but again, it will only be there temporarily unless uh, the, uh, the growth in, in our, our business uh, continues. Um, yeah, well, great, and, Paul. And then uh, James. One short no note on that also. Well, we are Nestle with 285,000 people in, in the world. We didn't have to lay off. We didn't have to restructure either because we always projected our, our strategy long term. And, and, and so we always uh, structuring for the long term. And, and not as nervous as some others. But um, uh, one other thing, globally, um, job creation, agriculture linked with that. One billion people is linked with agriculture. And, and, and there is food security issues. So there is a tension there that is positive if you see it positive. And, and, and that's why this point is so uh, much on our agenda, the agriculture agenda. Because you see, uh, the, 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 the irony of the whole thing is you have one billion people linked with agriculture. That's where food starts, and yet 800 million people of the 1 billion poor people who go to bed hungry are coming from the agriculture area. So there's quite a lot of uh, positive value creation that is possible to do there in that area too. And that's a little bit of a broader answer than just seeing the Western world in a crisis, which is not as felt in the other countries. There James, a, you want to go ahead. It's interesting. Marilyn Carlson, the uh, chair of Carlson Group, was very passionate within our sector about how we as an industry continue to do more as the service sectors grow. And it's bringing professionalism into waiting into, you know, the, um, uh, into the front line jobs as it is developing the management programs. If I look at my business, we're based in Abu Dhabi. We fly to 60 cities of the world. We have 110 different nationalities within the business. And over the next uh, 15 years, we'll take on 100 more aircraft. So the challenge for us is to have a skilled workforce. We have a small home market. And over the past three years, very focused through education on developing cadet pilot programs, engineer programs, but also within cabin crew from 100 different nationalities, from 
the CIS from uh, Thailand, from the Philippines, where that remittance back is very important um, to their family. So the challenge for us as we evolve and develop our business, and we see that across quite, a, quite our sector, is training, develop, bringing the young people through the, for the future with the right skill set. That's the key, the right skill set in the training program. Yes, yes. This, this is a very important question you raised, and I think the, the, the industries that are here, if I may make a comment, are uh, representing industries that probably have a positive outlook in terms of employment, consumers, services. The, the fact remains that uh, the, uh, the rest of the industry, particularly heavy industry, uh, in the developed market, continues to be a problem in the sense that we're going to lose jobs that we will never get back. And, uh, and therefore, that weighs on, on, on this issue of jobs and creates the society issues that we have. Therefore, the role of innovation in, in those developed markets is, is going to be key. And uh, if anybody wants to comment on this, either on the panel or from the audience, on what, what, what they believe the role of innovation is going to be for Europe, United States, Australia, I mean, the, 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 the countries where uh, it's hard to figure out how unemployment will drop to 2 or 3 or 4 percent in the foreseeable future. Anybody wants to comment on this? Patrick Ebicher, you've left? Yeah, Patrick has left. Anybody wants to comment on this? Yes. Yes, um, you're well placed to do this. Uh, we, can, uh, we can have some fun here. Um, Good. Um, you are all well traveled, and maybe um, some of you have traveled with, uh, with uh, his airplane, his aircraft as well. Uh, would it be an innovation of interest to you to have data connectivity while you fly with him? Hands up. Yes or no? Yes is up. Ah, there is an uncertain market here. I have that service with Intellinar, so we can make a sort of a crossover innovation <laughs> uh, to his aircrafts. Uh, and and uh, it, let's use that as a simple example on how sort of a new uh, service can develop by uh, industry collaboration. Uh, it's a long way of technical constraints and the regulation and all that kind of stuff to realize that to, uh, to come through, uh, and not, not the least the security issue. So there are many obstacles, but it's still one of those uh, sacred places where you're not connected in the same way as you usually are. And at least for the long hauls, there is a general feeling that uh, data connectivity would be an, an advantage. Over there, microphone. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the thoughts your name, I... Your name and your institution, yeah, please. Yeah. My name is uh, Saurabh Srivastava. I'm chairman of the Indian Venture Capital Association. Uh, the thought I had is that in the, develop, the developing countries, and we've talked a lot in, in Davos the last few days on the rise of Asia and all that, you be, literally have hundreds of millions of consumers, and there's a latent demand. But in effect, we haven't, as an industry, in the developed world produced the goods and services at the, right, at the right price point and the right functionality viewpoint. That paradigm has been missing. Uh, my sense is if we look at doing a bit more of that, and we're seeing, we've seen examples of that in India, for instance, in the mobile space. Uh, we're seeing it with the production of a $2,000 car. Uh, there's many such opportunities that would unleash huge, absolutely huge demand. And that would be to the benefit of uh, companies uh, in the developed world, creating new markets uh, for them, and therefore, to my mind, also generating uh, a lot of employment. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in the mobile space, till the right service at the right price point and till the right cell phones at the right price appeared, you had cell phone uh, calling costs at 40 cents a minute, and you had 20, 000, less than 100,000 cell phones. Is now 500 million and growing, uh, but at this point, coast to coast calling is less than a cent. Uh, so I think there's a model I suspect that people can look at that could have dramatic impact. Yeah. Paul? Yes, please. Yeah. Impact. Uh, just to comment on that, because it was not yeah. a question, but um, we calculate and, uh, that, that 1 billion new consumers are going to come into the cash economy uh, in the next 10 years. Um, 
one billion new consumers, yet you have to translate uh, the whole business model to them because you cannot do it with the products and the service that we have defined for a more affluent society. Uh, we in Nestle call that PPP, which is the popularly positioned products, which is not a product in a small sachet of only. It is rethinking the whole business model. Um, means a flexible small package, but also distribution, go where he buys it, um, bring it close to where he lives because he doesn't jump in his car because he doesn't have a car, uh, bring in the nutritional values that he looks for because their nutritional needs are different. That is really reshaping your whole business, but also producing it as close as possible. So you have to rethink your whole industrial setup and make very flexible packaging as close as possible to the consumer. So communication is different. Uh, he listens to a different language. Actually, he speaks another language, or he goes and listens to the radios. So it, it, it is not just a product per se. It is, it is the whole business modeling. And, uh, and what's so fascinating about the, 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 the times of today is that the developing world is developing more and more on their own terms. It is not anymore as it was used to be, which was trying to step in the footsteps of the developed world and trying to catch up. Basically, we, with the bad example, we have no authority to say that's the direction to go, so they start to go on their own ways. And so you, sh you see also new business modeling coming from these countries, which is quite interesting and fascinating. Lots of opportunities there if we get it right. Pat, yeah. Jean-Pierre, you also asked a, a question about innovation creating uh, opportunities in the developed countries for new jobs, and I think one that's often talked about quite a bit as its potential but hasn't fulfilled it yet is green technology jobs. So the innovation associated with providing new products and new ways to even produce old products that have a more sustainable footprint, have a greener footprint, have a way to use resources that are not perhaps as constrained or as environmentally sensitive as others, have huge, huge, huge potential for the yeah. use of innovation yeah. uh, on the upside. And, and I think there's more work to be done in that arena, whether it's from the venture capital, from uh, government's uh, um, focus, as well as the private sector. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yes, sir. Microphone here. Uh, Michael Ostrom, University of Minnesota, uh, and also I chair the Council on Pandemics. Yes. I just wanted to add a uh, footnote to Mr. Sorensen's important comments about uh, the current health threats. And while I surely agree with you for large parts of the world, the chronic disease issues are truly very important and will only become more important as the population ages. I think one of the things we have to understand is, is the great Wayne Gretzky in hockey once said, don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going to be. And ultimately for us in public health, we're seeing some trends in the developing world that actually really concern us greatly about where we're going to be five to 15 years down the road in overall health. I think many in the audience may not be aware of this, but while we talk about a world health, the, the median age of countries like Japan or the United States or many in the EU is in the low 40s. But the median age of equatorial Africa is 15 today. Chronic diseases are not their primary problem and won't be for some time relative to the other issues. And as we see the megatrends right now with the largest cities of the world all developing in the developing world and the constant uh, deterioration of public health infrastructure, clean water, crowding, issues around the kinds of things, mosquitoes and so forth that spread these diseases plus layover antibiotic resistance now, which has become a big problem. We actually see backsliding in many of these developing world countries with infectious diseases. So I surely don't want to diminish your point about chronic diseases there, but I think if we're talking about a worldwide development, we're talking about worldwide response, we really still will have a world of two healths. And we need to understand that that basic public health infrastructure is going to be a very important point. One last comment. I, Mr. Hogan, you raised the issue about influenza. I just want to point out to the world, we're not done yet with H1N1. Uh, we estimate that only half the world has either been infected or has had been vaccinated. And while it's been a very quiet six to eight weeks, we're now in some areas of the world beginning to see the resurgence. And we may be in for the third wave, which very well could reshape this next spring. Uh, into early summer again. And that again shows you the unexpected nature of infectious diseases that surely could have an impact on your industry all over again. Absolutely, and I think that the, the key issue there is communication. Um, 
a pandemic is a pandemic. It's there. It's it's, it's in the system. But uh, certainly, when the uh, the World Health Organization came out, and uh, in regard to the flu, um, I, I believe that was not communicated as well as it could due to the criticism of their handling of SARS, and that created part of the problem that we have to tackle. Of course, you know, we uh, are concerned there could be another wave, but I think public health authorities have a responsibility to communicate um, more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paul. On a general note, um, I heard a very interesting phrase that says, um, that defines what a pessimist is, and a pessimist is an optimist who went to Davos. Um, um, <laughs> I'm an optimist still, so it's not true what has been said. Um, uh, but um, there is an interesting thing that, that may become something that we have to look and think of more explicitly, which is uh, how nutrition links up with health and, and how uh, you can start speaking about health economics because healthcare is starting to explode in cost and all that. So the cost definitely is there, and we're pushing it forward, but it's there, it's going to come. And yet, uh, it is known that um, uh, with good nutrition, and that, uh, the, there the whole micronutrients and all that come to play for big parts of the population, uh, how that then spills over into healthier people, more productive, and so on and so on, and no healthcare cost at the end, or much less. These are equations. The problem is the equation is nutrition now, healthcare cost reduction in 30 years, maybe, and that's not really a political agenda. And yet, at the same time, we should start talking about these things because it's going to make sense. Healthcare cost is not financed for the future. So we should do now already and work very much on nutrition and, and micronutrients and having a more balanced uh, diets and education, very much linked with education, nutritional day education. So, and that's pretty much linked uh, with what we're looking for as a company, uh, to, to be part of that uh, 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 clarity on that healthcare uh, economics or health economics. Yes, gentlemen here. Arjun Dhavan, Hindustan Construction Company, India. Um, one of the trends um, that uh, that's happened over the last couple of decades is the is the movement of um, manpower intensive manufacturing industries from the West, um, you know, to developing countries. And that's you know arguably uh, tempted to smoothen out the business cycle, or at least move the, the, the risk of um, hiring and firing you know, out of your industries and where you actually capture some of the more higher margin, um, higher value uh, parts of the value chain. Um, uh, with, with such high unemployment now in, in the West, I'm curious, and with you know, parts of developing countries now moving up the value chain, I'm curious as to whether you see job creation now becoming more difficult uh, in the West because you're at already arguably at a higher part of the value chain, so now you've got to focus perhaps on far more productive ways to create jobs rather than you know, simply increasing manpower. Yes, Lars. Yeah, certainly, uh, the social cohesion in the West is uh, under some significant threat, and I think that we all, of course, uh, are looking for innovation and how to create new products, and, and these products will be generating growth. Uh, we're going to create knowledge-based jobs uh, in the West, uh, but we need to develop some kind of social flexibility so that we can develop a service industry. There are lots of things which, which can be done, but many of our societies uh, are very much locked uh, between uh, the roles that the, the unions define uh, and the roles that the governments define. Uh, I think it's, it's a big issue you're touching on, and, I, and I've, I'm quite fearful of that, that we may, as private corporations, be successful in developing growth, but a lot of that employment growth is going to come elsewhere, and, and hence uh, trickling down to employment and job opportunities in our home countries is going to be a big issue. It's interesting. If you look at the um, statistics of Airbus and Boeing and aircraft moving forward, there are considerable sales. But the MROs, the maintenance providers of airlines, have been moving out of Europe because the European MROs haven't been able to be competitive. Um, SRT was one of the leading uh, providers of aircraft maintenance in Ireland, which has effectively been moved offshore due to um, 
quite frankly, uh, unions and employers not being able to agree. I won't get ready to go too far down that political track, but I look at the British Airways uh, issue today of a, 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 a great brand having to re-engineer itself to create, create opportunity moving forward, and the position they're in, in not in fact damaging the, the current uh, staff members' uh, benefits package, but saying, okay, new, in, new joiners will be at a second level uh, so the business can survive, and the union saying, well, we can't, we can't accept that. Um, is damaging that business. So I think within the West, and I've actually been uh, the chief operating officer of a European airline, uh, probably what I, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge of legacy businesses is difficult to, to rework, and these are the times they need to be reworked. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Frederick, you wanted to say something on this? Um, I, I'm, whether this aspect has a sort of stopped the, uh, or put the temporary halt or whatever in that kind of dynamics. Uh, difficult to say, but um, those dynamics um, are there to sort of create new efficiencies, and everyone will, in a way, hunt for those new uh, efficiencies longer term. So whether there is sort of a period where these things are, are, are taking a pause or taking sort of finding a lever, uh, a level, uh, there w then there will be other phases uh, which will sort of uh, create new efficiencies that uh, I think uh, international uh, trade and industry, in a way, will be in search for. I mean, that's uh, a bit of the, the generic of the system. Uh, but to build upon um, what uh, Lars was saying on uh, um, the crossover between ICT and, and health, if I may, um, because this was also uh, regarded as a, a big opportunity uh, from the ICT side. And it seemed to be sort of two directions coming out of our session, our joint session. Uh, first was that of healthcare uh, in the mature world where uh, sort of the issue of uh, um, chronic diseases coming as a, uh, as a part of our societies where there are purchasing powers as, uh, identified around it. There are business models that you can develop. And here there are a lot of crossovers between ICT and healthcare in general. Uh, but then there is the, the other aspect of uh, ICT and health, and that is for emerging economies where there are sort of other and basic needs that needs to be addressed. Uh, and in Bangladesh, for example, uh, in Grameen Phone, we have brilliant examples on how we brought uh, health care to villages through the connectivity that was offered to the villages. Um, and, and maybe we can say that, well, uh, we don't want to be cured over the net. But if the alternative is not there, then the net is actually a perfect communicator for getting uh, medical competences into that village for relevant uh, diseases. Not necessarily all diseases, but of course relevant diseases. So there are many potentials there, but to find the right collaboration then between the partners enabling such a service, that might be sort of a local solution, country by country. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Any final question? We've got a couple of minutes. Yes, sir, over there. Thank you. Uh, Bart Haag from the Business Daily Detail in Brussels. I have one last question about high unemployment in Europe and the United States. Okay. In what way is it changing uh, consumer markets and uh, does it have an impact on, on spending power and in that way changing cons consumer markets? Well, that, that is definitely for a consumer industry. It looks like. It looks like, huh? <laughs> oh, Paul, you. Yeah, the airplane industry is not linked directly, although no, it's, no. It's, it is, though. Uh, <laughs> it is clear that unemployment, and not only the unemployment per se, but also the uh, and perception is reality for much of, uh, lots of people, the, 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 the fear to lose jobs. And uh, actually, we didn't ha have that yet. Uh, until now, we have pushed also the problem with all the safety nets and all uh, a little bit forward, more in Europe. In the United States, unemployment went up faster because they don't have all these safety nets. And actually, they react then also faster uh, to go and, and grow em uh, employment again. But fact is, increasing unemployment and the perception of it. That changes purchasing behavior. And that's why you have this uh, famous trading down and, 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 and as a consumer, uh, uh, goods company and, and food, which is actually less nervous in these reactions because, uh, well, people eat, but they may start eating differently or you have the private label issue and all. 
And there you have to really uh, use the whole power of, uh, of creativity and innovation and innovation. Because what we do, for example, is make sure that people can uh, go for other price points in our brands. So there is, there is quite, there's no one answer. There are many answers to that. But you have to be very, very aware of it and go with the consumer. You have actually to have empathy for the consumer and how he lives and answer true products, and that needs creativity. Yet at the same time, you see different behaviors. For example, out of home, people stay more at home. There is lots of opportunities linked with that too. He doesn't eat, eat in a restaurant with his family, goes home. We can give some good answers there too. So it's not only problems. There's lots of um, opportunities too, I said. I'm an optimist. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> well, we're about uh, finished, so uh, um, uh, I would like you to uh, uh, thank the panel. I mean, uh, those five CEOs have been pretty open to you, and uh, we've had a good exchange, so uh, thank you very much for your attendance here. <laughs> well done.